hand of Jesus stepped out upon his promise, yet it seems you have trusted in vain. The answer you have prayed for, it's on its way and paid for. Hold on a little longer, hold on. Hold on a little longer, hold on a little stronger. The testings of the Lord are pure gold. He'll take you through the fire, he'll burn out the dross and mire. Hold on a little longer, hold on. You're watching for his coming, you're wondering why he's waiting. Hold on a little longer, hold on. Those clouds will soon be bursting, the Son of God descending. Hold on a little longer, hold on. Hold on, pray on. Hold on a little longer, hold on. Hold on, believe on. Hold on a little longer, hold on. I care not today what tomorrow may bring If shadow or sunshine or rain The Lord I know will it for everything And all of my worry is vain Living by faith Yes, living by faith Living by faith And Jesus alone Living by faith some years ago and the walls were swiftly falling to decay and the yard was full of thistles and that old roof was rotted so that the storms beating upon me night and day then the spirit came and told me of a wonderful abode where from wind and storm I'd find a safe retreat so the Sega sent his moving van And he took me up the road To the little house on Hallelujah Street I shall never forget the day That I moved from sin away And secured a change of address so complete Since that moment without fail I've been getting all my mail At the little house on Hallelujah Street now the neighbors in the alley where I lived in years gone by, they have never ceased their talking from that day that I left them so abruptly without bidding them goodbye. And from all the sin and shame, I moved away. Since the shack of sin is empty, where I lived so many years, and no more they hear the treading of my feet, I've moved away forever from the sorrow and the tears to my little house on Hallelujah Street. Now this house is nice and cozy, and its walls so warm and tight. And the landlord doesn't charge me any rent. There's a garden in connection, filled with flowers gay and bright, where so many golden hours I have spent. Yeah, the landscape is so lovely, and the songbirds sing with glee. And I'm never hungry for good things to eat. And I'm never, never lonely 
for the Savior dines with me at my little house on Hallelujah Street. Well, I've just received a letter from the king up in glory land that he soon is coming after all his own. He will roll down the avenue with retinue so grand, picking up the saved and blood washed all alone. When I hear the wheels are rumbling and I hear the angel's song, and I see that God's redemption is complete. I am sure he'll stop and take me from the place I've lived so long at the little house on Hallelujah Street. So I'm looking for the day when he'll carry me away and I'll make another move that can't be beat. When I leave this earthly veil, I'll no longer get my mail at my little house on Hallelujah Street. Shall all stand still? 
One day, one day will be our last day here. One day we will go home. We will be finished with this life. The warfare will be over. The battle ahead, the fighting, and uh, the warring, a good warfare, it will be over. We will say with Paul, I, I hope that we can say with the Apostle Paul, that I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And I, I hope that can be said. Uh, about you and I. I hope we can say that on our deathbeds. That I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. There is fighting and warring while we are here. Where there is no rest here when it comes to that. There is constant warfare until we go home. And we need to remember that. We need to always keep that in mind. That, that, there's the, that there's the battle. There's the war. There's the fight. And I'm telling you what. You better be fighting. You better not be given into sin and wickedness. And then name in the name of Christ. Because the Bible says they that name the name of Christ should depart from iniquity. I tell people, if you don't want to live for God, don't be telling people you're a Christian then. Just shut your stinking mouth. Because if you don't want to live separated from sin, if you don't want to live for the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't want to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life, then stop telling people you're a Christian. Because all you're doing is confusing people. All you're doing is confusing them and and, and, and sending them mixed messages. You're confusing your children. You're confusing others. Other people are being confused by you. Because you don't live a consistent Christian life. And and let me tell you something too, by the way, you parents out there. If you don't be surprised when your children turn out to be some spiritual bastards. Let me say that again for you. Don't be surprised if your children turn out to be some spiritual bastards. Because you live like a bunch of hypocrites. You don't live consistent. You don't live for the Lord. And you confuse your children by that. I'm going to tell you what, you want to raise some messed up kids, you just you just live a double life. You go to church or you listen to preaching and then you live in sin. You want to talk about confusing some people. You want to talk about confusing kids that they won't think anything's real, man. I've had people do that. They'll take my teachings against Disney and and pornography and, and all kinds of other things, Hollywood and whatever, and then they'll be drinking booze and partying and living like hell or treating their family poor, or not spending time with their kids or not doing anything, and then rail on their kids for watching Disney or something like that. And their kids are standing around like, well, you don't even live for God. You're getting drunk, smoking cigarettes, chewing tobacco, living like the devil. Just shut up if you're going to do that. Just shut up if you're going to live like that. Because you do more damage for the cause of Christ by living inconsistent and living hypocritical. You'll make them doubt the power of God. You'll make them doubt whether, whether... the power of God is real or not. They'll think, well, man, if it ain't real enough to change you, how's it real then? If it ain't real enough to make you a better daddy or a better mama, how in the world is it ever going to make me better?
Somebody asked the question, Pastor, do you think a person can be saved and be a cigarette smoker? Sure. And I think when they see, and if I think if they get under strong preaching and they're saved by the grace of God, they're going to throw them things away. That's what I believe. Well, if you know it's pointing at you, brother, why don't you do something about it? I'm so sick of seeing people whine about things and not standing up and doing something about it. All talk and no action. You can talk about, you can whine about, or you can, you can by the grace of God, stand up and do right. That's just it. I don't believe in that Christianity that's not where the rubber meets the road Christianity. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in a gospel that doesn't change somebody. I believe the Lord continues to work on our hearts. He continues to deal with us until we're dead. Continuing, continuing to perfect that which he started in us. And he'll perform it until the day of Christ. Too many people sitting around feeling sorry for themselves, living in sin. If you're saved by the grace of God, then you got the power of God to do something about it. I don't believe in a gospel that doesn't give men power over sin. I don't believe that nonsense. Do they fall? Yeah, we're going to talk about a man who fell today. But like I've always said, you don't live dead. Some of these people think they got saved and they just live a whole backslidden life not uh, saved. Well, if that's true, I'll tell you what. You'll be doing and you won't be a-talking. Because those people that are a-talking, they ain't, they ain't a-doing. And that's the difference. I'm going to tell people right now, shut up until you're willing to do something for God. Until you're willing to have a track record of doing something, then shut your mouth. Because all you're doing is spreading a bunch of damage. All you're doing is spreading a bunch of problems. All you're doing is confusing some kids. And you wonder why they grow up and go to hell. That's why. That's exactly why. One of the good reasons. It's important that God's people live consistent lives. We're going to talk about David today. We're going to talk about the lust of the eyes. And really, I I, I just, uh, you know, porn is just part of it. I'm not really going to talk about porn that much, but this will help with any of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, you know, and the pride of life. It'll deal with all of those things, but it gives you an account where we talk about David's life a bit. Very sober. Very sober, very serious life. It matters how we live. You know, I think about the 30 plus kids that are in this church. And I think about and pray about God keeping me from evil. Because Satan would have us, man, I'm going to tell you what, Satan wants us to fall. He wants God's people to fall. Why? Because the enemies of the Lord blaspheme God when one of his, one of his saints fall. And he, and he never wants one to fall more than he does one of, one of his generals, one of the Lord's generals. Man, he would have them fall. 
Satan would love to have them fall. Because then the enemies of the Lord can blaspheme. That's why I have to have a constant dependence on God. And you need to pray for me. And I hope you are praying for me. I hope you are. I hope you pray for me constantly and I hope you pray for other pastors. I hope you are praying for us and for one another. That's important. Now, this account of David with Bathsheba here, I, I'm going to read you some things from Bishop Hall and give you some thoughts from Matthew Henry. Then I'm going to get into my lesson here. But first, I'll say hi to everybody. Pilgrim lady on here. Becca got, got in second place there. Mary Teresa, a.k.a. The man from the basement, Carl Winters, is actually on Mary's computer today. Joe McDonnell, Big Whale, Big Whale. Jody, how are you? Carry Jesus is Lord, Proverbs, just the book of Proverbs, that's it. Just the book of Proverbs. Joshua with the blue wrench. Andrea, how are you? Lulu, Vanilla Berry. Brother Scott. Chain Break. All right. So anyway... We're going to we're going to get into this today and we're going to talk about what happened with David a little bit and really what I want to focus on is the lust of the eyes and protections against it that's just not pornography that's lusting with your eyes after things I want to, we'll read, and it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon. Remember, the children of Ammon, what they had done, they stripped David's men down. Remember how they treated the ambassadors of David? Well, David went and sent the army to go take revenge, only David didn't go with them. But... David, it said the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. Well, while David had sent Joab to besiege Rabbah, Satan had come to besiege David's heart. Satan came after David's heart. Let me give you a word of advice. The first word of advice when it comes to the lust of the eyes. And write this down and take a note of this and remember it. Idleness is the twin of every other sin. Idleness is the twin of every other sin. If you find yourself being idle, Satan will find you. Satan ever looks for the saints who are idle. And he is sure to attack them and go after them.
Some of you sitting around, you ain't got nothing better to do, so you're surfing on the internet. You're going to get into trouble baselessly surfing on the internet. Get to work. Get to study. Get to your Bibles. Get to sermons. Get to Bible study. Whatever it is, get to it. Idleness is ever the twin to any other sin, to any other lust, to any other thing of the heart that your heart covets after. David, the first way for you to get into sin is for you to leave the plain path of duty. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the times when kings go forth to battle. David sent Joab. You know, David, he didn't go out to fight. He sent Joab to fight. That's why having a schedule and keeping yourself busy in the work of the Lord, keeping yourself busy with your family, not baselessly being idle, is so important. I find that busy people do not really get into sin as much as lazy people do, idle people do. Idle people get into sin. David made a costly mistake. He gave, the lust of the eyes were running rampant. Why? Because his heart was not fixed, O oh God. Like he said before, my heart is fixed, O oh Lord. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. David's heart was not fixed. I like what Bishop Paul says. He says, with what unwillingness, with what fear do I still look upon the miscarriage of the man after God's own heart? O holy prophet, who can promise himself always to stand when he sees thee fallen and maimed with the fall? Who can assure himself of an immunity from the foulest sins when he sees thee offending so heinously, so bloodily? Let profane eyes behold thee contentedly as a pattern, as an excuse of sinning. I shall never look upon thee but through tears as a woeful spectacle of human infirmity. Matthew Henry said this about it. He said, many, no doubt, have been emboldened to sin and hardened in it by this story. And to them, it is a savor of death unto death. They'll use David's excuse to sin. But many have been awakened to a holy jealousy over themselves and a constant watchfulness over sin. And to them it is the savor of life unto life. How you use this story and how you use this example, it really does matter. If you use David's sin as an excuse... It's a savor of death unto death, and God will give you over to your own depravity if that's what you want. But if you use it as a holy caution and a warrant to be careful, to be cautious, to see that lest thou also be tempted, then you will be wise. Then you'll use it as a savor of life unto life. It will be used as a protection to warn you. David never got out of anything. People will see the life of David here and they will say, I, you hear people comment about eternal security. Now they don't believe it, right? They don't believe eternal security. Oh, I, I don't believe once saved, always saved. Oh, I don't believe that. I believe you can lose your salvation. Really? Well, when I look at David's life, here's what I see. I see a man 
that was completely and utterly devastated by his sin. And he would have rather died. He would have rather have died. Then go through what he was going through. David had the blessing of the promise of God on his life. That God was going to preserve him and his seed. But you know something? David lived with that sword that did not pass his house for the rest of his life. The chastening of the Lord was sore upon David's soul. Sore upon his soul. David suffered greatly for his sin. While Joab and all Israel were busy in the war against Amon, in the siege of Rabbah, Satan finds time to lay siege to the secure heart of David. Whoever found David thus tempted, thus foiled in the days of his busy wars. Not only do I see the king of Israel rising from his bed in the evening, the time was when he arose up in the morning to his early devotions, and he break his nightly rest with public cares, with the business of the state. He prayed, early will I seek thy face. At noon and at night I will cry aloud unto the Lord. But not now. David was idle. The indus- Listen to this c- comment. The industrious man hath no leisure to sin. The idle hath neither leisure nor power to avoid sin. If you're idle, you don't have any power to avoid sin. You're going to give in to it. That's why you need to be about your father's business. You need to be busy. You need to be working. You need to be doing things for the Lord. You need to be about you need to be about your family and raising them and leading them and guiding them. Not sitting around sinning and living like hell. But busy. Idleness again is the twin of so many sins. You ought to keep busy in your master's work. You ought to labor in doctrine and prayer. Watch that you enter not into temptation. While Joab is busy securing the city, Satan is securing a temptation on David's heart. Was David tempted when he was busy warring? No. Not really. Not in the same way. He had no time for that. You know, I find that a lot of these young men that get into pornography and everything else, they're sitting around doing nothing. They're working like 20 hours a week. Sitting in their mom's basement, not being diligent, not working hard, not keeping busy, not working their bone so they're tired and they go home and they go to bed and they drop. They're more idle. They're not diligent. If you got time to sin, you got time to serve God. And by the way, that goes for women too. You got a work to do. If you've got if you've got a husband, if you've got children, you've got work to do. You don't have time to sit around and act like a uh, a fool. You've got time to be busy, time to work, time to raise your children, time to teach them the Bible, Try, time to teach them how to be a wife, how to teach them how to be a good son. You know, while David was busy, he he stayed out of trouble. When he sat around, he got in trouble. You want to let the lust of the flesh take over the lust of the eyes? Don't be busy about your father's business.
Learn this, though, too, that afflictions and things that smite us are not actually bad. A lot of times when I'm afflicted with sorrows and different things, the Lord uses it as a governor upon me to keep me focused and to keep me doing what I need to do, to keep me busy about my father's business and to make me sensitive to sin. But David is on the mountain of victory or ease. There's much danger in prosperous times. Remember that. There's much danger when your times are prosperous. You know, David, when he was in battle, he rose early. He got things done. You know, Satan rarely attacks a busy person. And when he does, it's brushed off quickly. When his attacks and his temptations come or when we're sitting around doing nothing, being idle and having time to conjure things up in our minds. When you have time to conjure things up in your mind. Satan looks for us to be idle. He comes, you know what? When you're not doing something, when you're not busy, that's when Satan comes to have a chat with you. That's when he comes to talk to you. It's when he comes to have a conversation with you is when you're idle. When you have nothing to do. That's when he comes to talk to you, to tempt you, to give you. That's what he did to David. And it came to pass in the eventide that David rose off from his bed, from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the wolf, ro- from the wolf, <laughs> from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was be- very beautiful to look upon. So here's the first, here's the second mistake of David. He continued to look at something that was law- not lawful for him to see. Now, had he glanced over that way and saw that, it had been no sin for him to look away from that and not look at it again and ask God to take it from his heart. But see, David didn't do that. It says, and David sent and inquired after the woman and one said, is not this Bathsheba? the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. This is the perfect example of James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse number 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's what happened to David. That is the perfect example of what happens to you and I when sin, when we are taken by sin.
We can never keep a covenant with God if we keep not one with our eyes. David being the chief offender, he's, he's the seeker of sin. David goes after David goes after the sin. He sought it. Now one could make the argument as well that the woman should have been more careful where she bathed her ceremonial cleaning. Isn't it amazing that she did this ceremonial cleaning of her infirmity that she had? But she became dirtier than ever after that bath. Because she did it in the sight of, of, you know, David. She didn't know that at first. She didn't know that. But let me give a word of caution to ladies. Be very careful how you present yourself to men. Be very cautious concerning your conversation with men. Be very cautious concerning your walk, your talk, the way you dress, and the way you conduct yourself. Men are designed to be attracted to women. And in today's world, Women dress horribly for the most part. Let me say something to you that that is not popular, that makes people not want to follow this ministry, that gets people upset at me, and all that kind of stuff. I just, just throw it out there to you. There is absolutely zero reason why you should ever wear any clothing lady that shows your cleavage off. Your breasts are for your husband, and you should keep them covered. No man should ever see your breasts besides your husband. They should be covered. And here's another thing. Here's another thing that that doesn't make me any friends. You shouldn't be caught dead wearing as your normal attire yoga pants or tights or whatever you leggings or whatever you want to call them those are meant to go under your clothing they are under clothing and for you to show the entire shape of your body is just as bad as bathing in front of a man i'm going to say that again it's just as bad as you basically being naked in front of the man Because you leave nothing, nothing to be desired of. And and let me take it a step further. As the weather, as the weather gets there. Let me, let me take it a step further. You shouldn't be caught dead. In a bikini. Or a swimsuit around other men. Or your children, by the way. And maybe Heidi Rain Country, maybe maybe she can maybe she can make some swim skirts. Maybe she has some. If not, add that to your list, Heidi. I guarantee you I got a bunch of women here that'll probably buy them. I've got some daughters and a wife that I'm sure she will. So get cracking at it. Get that get that uh get that needle out and get sewing. Get that get that machine out and get working. We'll get you some business. Because you shouldn't be wearing anything like that. And people hate modesty, and pastors won't talk about it. They won't talk about it. Because they don't want to offend anybody, and their wives don't dress right.
I should never see the shape of, uh, 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 of, of another woman's figure like that. No man should see the shape of their figure like that. Say, well, they shouldn't be dirty. They shouldn't be dirty-minded. Well, the eyes of a man are never satisfied. And that's right. Lust comes from the heart. And they're not given a pass. But neither are you. Because what's in your mind, lady, if you'll dress like that around another man? I like the way it looks. Well, so do they. By the way, you ought to care more for how the Lord wants you to look than how you want to look. You ought not want to identify with the world. You ought not want to identify with the world, lady. You ought to want to identify with God-fearing, feminine, soft, gentle ladies. That's, that's what you ought to desire. Just remember, just remember, in heaven, God's going to clothe you the way he clothed Eve. That robe of righteousness covered. With shamefacedness and sobriety. Right? So anyway, we'll get back to David's sin here, but let's not skip over Bathsheba's sin. See, I think David was more in the transgression. I would agree. I agree with that. Because David was the king. David was the man after God's own heart. David knew better. David had more of the responsibility, and David sought out the sin. So I agree with you. But do we really wish do we really wish to Lay blame in one place and not the other? Do, do we not search our own hearts first for the sin that lies in us? Do we not look at ourselves first into that perfect law of liberty and, and say, you know what, Lord, what about me? What am I guilty of? What what are you call what are you telling me? That I not make my brother or sister trespass, or I not tempt them. Amen? So you think about that one. We look here that David had fallen. David was the chief offender. He was the seeker of the sin. But where was the restraint of this woman in matrimony? Where was her restraint? Why did she give in so easy? Now, it is true the danger of men in authority have an attraction to women, women have an attraction to men in authority. They looked at, they looked at, she would look at um, David as, as a godly man. And by the way, godly men can fall if they, if they don't, if they're not careful. And that's why it's so important for them to be careful because they can influence others. We've seen pastors that get tangled up with 17, 18, 19-year-old girls. Now, I don't know where the father is of that 17, 18, 19-year-old girl and why that, why that, listen, very closely. I have no 
reason to ever, and I'm saying this to my wife, which she already knows, I'm saying this to my church, and I'm saying this to all of you, I have no reason to ever meet with a girl alone like that. Ever. There is no counsel that I can give her that my wife or other godly women in the church can't give her, which is the elder women's duty to teach the younger women. It's not even actually my direct duty. My direct duty is to teach their fathers. My direct duty is to teach their mothers uh, in, the, in the state of the assembly. My exact duty is to teach them through the scriptures as an assembly. My duty is not to have conversations with them. My duty is to stay away from them. I love them. I pray for them. Uh, the, the children, the young girls, and, and, and all of these kids, the boys. I'll, I, have a, I have a relationship with all of them in, in a godly way. All these children come, and Sunday afternoons, they all recite Bible verses. I, I listen to their Bible verses, and I, I, I have a rapport with them. I love them. I care for them. I pray for them. But I love God. And I don't have any reason to talk to them like that. I got, there's women online that try to contact me. And they're probably not women. They're probably 400-pound fat cops that are in their basement getting their jollies off of trying to trap somebody. It's probably who they are. But, and they put these pictures up and act like they're, you know, like one lady put on there. Hey, handsome. And I just, I was like, this is stupid. This is so retarded. It's just dumb. Um, but anyway, so I showed my wife and we just laughed, kind of. But, uh, I mean, we're not laughing at the sin. We're, we're laughing at the attempt to be so foolish, you know. Um, anyway, but that's how people get, get caught up. That's how pastors can get caught up. Nope. I don't want to be caught up. God help me. God deliver me. God keep me from evil. I had a pastor once tell me, well, you know, you might want to be careful about that, but I've never really had a problem with that. Now, he did grow up right and everything, and he wasn't exposed to a lot of the evil that I was as a lost person and everything like that, but mm, no, I, I, I like having layers between me and others. I just, I do. I like having the layers. It's just better that way. And you learn that the longer you're pastoring also. David, he searches out the sin here. We're going to get into the lust of the eyes. We're going to really get in there and talk about that in a second. Kind of go over that. By the way, I, you know, my, my Facebook messenger and all that kind of stuff, same thing. My wife sees all of it. I show her right away when something weird happens. Like, I just show it right away. I show her right away because she has access to it. It's right there. By the way, I think God-fearing holy women are more attractive than the world's. So that's why it's incumbent upon me, uh, by the grace of God and my wife, to put those layers up between. Because real women are attractive. Men, women that, we, the, these ladies that run around and dress like, like sluts, they're, they're, they're not really attractive. See, it's the familiarity with the people that you know that can cause trouble, that can be dangerous. That's the fam the familiarity of it is is dangerous. So that's why it's important to be careful. So David sent and inquired after the woman, 
And one said, is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David knew. He continues to double down. David even found out before he ever touched her. She was the wife of Uriah the Hittite, one of your men. One of your mighty men. Satan ever likes to tempt the people of God with things that they can't, that that is not lawful for them to have. By the way, let me give you a word of advice about the lust of the eyes when it comes to this as well. That's the same thing as when you see, it's important, you better be careful not spending too much time with other couples. I don't mean you don't go out to dinner. we We do that. We take different you know, husbands and wives out and and spend some time fellowshipping and things like that. But it's very important that you're careful not to spend too much time. I'll tell you why. Because what you start doing is, you'll you'll start doing in your mind is comparing. Oh, I wish my wife was more like sister so-and-so. Or I wish my husband was more like brother so-and-so. You start chambering that in your images of your chambers of your imagery, and you start lusting after that in your heart. No, you love the one you're with. By the way, let me tell you something, husband and wife. You got all you can handle with the one that God has given you. You have all you can handle. The Bible says, be thou ravished with her love. Let her breast satisfy thee always. You got enough, husband, you got enough to to learn who your wife is. You have enough to learn who she is. It'll take you your entire life. And just when you start to figure figure her out, you die. You go home to be with the Lord. Just when you start getting things to work right. When you've matured enough to figure it out. And that's the way that's the way it is. So you have your whole life. A woman's heart is like a deep well. The Bible talks about that. You have to draw things out of it. You have to learn her. And see, one of the dangers of David was is that he was never emotionally invested in any of his wives because he had multiple wives. This is this is really the fruit also of polygamy. Because David ended up having multiple wives. His heart was never invested in his wives and in one of his wives. He was never satisfied. He was never emotionally invested into that woman. Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's why you've got to be emotionally invested. You need to be emotionally invested. David wasn't. That's why it was so easy for him to do what he did also. He wasn't emotionally invested. Very dangerous. Very dangerous place to be. You need to be giving your heart to your spouse. Talking things over. Investing in their lives. Emotionally, spiritually, physically. Invested. And by the way, some of you men are such stinking cowards that you won't do it. You won't have hard conversations. You won't direct your family. You won't lead them because you're a coward. And you're not being a man, and you won't do it. And some of you ladies have been hurt before, and you won't emotionally invest. You won't give your heart. You won't have those heart-to-heart conversations. Some of you are going to go your whole marriage never investing and never loving each other. Just abiding and being together. 
And then your children are going to be raised, and then you got nothing in common because you never talked to each other for 20 years, 30 years. So your children are raised, they grow up, they get out of the house, and you get a divorce. You're like, how could we do this? We were Christians. Well, you spent 25 years never talking to each other, never emotionally invested into each other's life, never caring, never praying with each other, never holding each other's hands, never becoming intimate in fellowship and in love and in care and emotion, emotionally meeting your spouse's needs. That's why. By the way, what you're getting right now is pastoral advice. That's what you're getting. That's what that is. That's the same things that I say to this congregation and the people of this, of this church. That's why you need a church, by the way. That's why you need a good Bible-preaching church and be a part of it and surrender to it. That's why you need that. You know, it's been said that the eyes, Jody Hammond, I know full well what that's like. People become afraid to be vulnerable after being hurt. They sure do, and they're jaded. But I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I, I have to. You know, after four, four years ago or more, when I was hurt really bad in the ministry and betrayed and lied about and all kinds of awful things happened. I'll tell you what, I didn't want to trust nobody. I didn't want to ever go back online again. I, I, I wanted to walk away from it all. I wanted to be away from it. I didn't want to trust anybody. I didn't want to give my heart to anybody. But you know what? You can't live your life like that as a Christian. You can't be hollow as a Christian. You can't be hollow. You know... The eye, it's been said that the eyes are the windows of the soul. Mine eye affecteth my heart. It's very true. Let's talk about the lust of the eyes. I think it's Jeremiah. Here it is. Lamentations 351. Mine eye affecteth mine heart because of all the daughters of my city. Hmm. You know, boy, there's a lot that could be said about that. I think I said most of it, though. How they dress, how they walk, how they talk, how they act. But mine eye affecteth mine heart. It does. What I allow my eyes to see, to fix upon, will affect my heart and can be a, gre a breeding ground for sin. You know, the one thing that we have to be careful of is, is I, I don't think there's any man that doesn't struggle with that because there are literally naked women everywhere they go. This is so different than in the day and age of, of, of other places where it just wasn't lawful for women to dress that way at all. You used to have to go to a whorehouse. Now you walk into Target or Walmart and it's a whorehouse. You walk into a grocery store, you walk into a Target, you walk into a, a Walmart and plastered all over the place are women in bikinis and walking up and down the aisle are women that are naked. That's very challenging for a man. I don't care who the man is. 
save Jesus Christ. He's the only one. But it's going to affect him. It's going to affect the man. It's, it's going to impact him. His eye affects his heart. That's how it is with men. Especially. Now, all of us, but men especially. That's how it is. Mine eye affecteth my heart. Proverbs 27. Hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. Men have this wandering you know they have to they have to battle a wandering eye. It's very easy for them to for their eye to wander. It's not an excuse. I'm just telling you it is. And if you've been exposed to pornography in your life, your eyes definitely wander. And you have to fight that. You have to battle that. Men have to guard themselves. They have to put a guard on their heart. Yeah, by the way, that's another thing in feeding your babies. Yeah, that's that's what nursing is for. That's what those breasts are for. That's true. But the other thing is, you know what? Cover yourself when you're feeding your baby. You don't need to expose your breasts. Well, I can do this, and you expose your breasts. You don't need to do that. Why would you do that? What would be the purpose in exposing your breasts to other men? Because you can? Why would you want to? You shouldn't want to. Especially in a society that we live in today that is an absolutely over-sexualized society. Right? That's what it is. Uh, let's see. First John 2.16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. That's what first got Eve. The lust of the eyes. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, what happened? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. It was pleasant to the eyes. That's why no one is supposed to see your body. Because to a man, those things are pleasant to his eyes. But they're unlawful. Just like this was unlawful. But she did it anyway. It's 
So our first mother, Eve, same thing. Lust of the eyes. Then we have Joshua. Chapter 7. Achan. What happened to him? Here's what happened to him. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. Then I coveted them and took them and behold, they are hidden the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. He saw them and then he coveted them. His eyes. He saw them and he coveted them. That's the lust of the eyes. Comes from the heart. But the eyes are the windows to that heart. Matthew 15, I believe it's verse number 19. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. Mark 7 talks about that. I'll tell you, the longer you're saved, the more you'll be burdened over that. About watching and being careful with your eyes. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and, and defile the man, the man. You know, how do we look at that when we look at the difference between uh, David and Joseph? Joseph was taken aback and surprised by Potiphar's wife, wasn't he? But what happened when the fires of lust came to kindle on Joseph's heart? Jo Joseph's heart doused it. It was wet. It couldn't be sparked. Joseph knew that his sin would be against the Lord. And Joseph didn't give in to that sin. Joseph ran. What, the, what is the difference? Here's the difference. Here's what Joseph did. Because this is the idea that Paul is giving here. Or, excuse me, Peter says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. So we're told to abstain from them. We're told to abstain from those fleshly lusts because they war against our souls. So we're to abstain from them, stay away from them, turn from them. We're told to flee from them. Flee also youthful lusts. I mean, David was a 50-year-old man. He should have known better. Right? He wasn't some young kid like Joseph. He was a 50-year-old man.
right? He was a 50-year-old man. But he didn't know better, did he? Because Satan caught him, surprised him, tempted him, and he fell. You know, the Bible says that David fetched her. He fetched her like a dog fetches a ball and took her to his house. She became his wife. There was a war of lust, and David gave in to it. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Let's see. Let me see if I can find that. Look at this. What else are we supposed to do with those? We're to crucify them. They're crucified. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So we're to abstain from fleshly lusts. We're to flee from fleshly lusts. We're to crucify the flesh. We are counted ourselves as crucified. He says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live by the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We're to crucify the affections the flesh with the affections and lusts. Crucify them. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. How do I do that? I look away from them. Let's see. It's Job. I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? So he's saying I was careful not to think, to look on her and think about her and lust after her. Jesus talks about that. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, committeth adultery with her already in his heart. So it's that looking twice. It's that look back. And then it's that conjuring up in the chambers of my Im imagery. So I have to be careful not to look on a woman to lust after her. Jesus says, if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. No, he's not speaking like the Catholics. He doesn't want you to rip your eyeballs out. He's saying hell is way worse. So get saved by the grace of God and get power over the flesh. Power over sin. He's not telling you to beat yourself or cut parts of your body off or anything like that. 
He's given you the example that all these sins qualify you for hell, and you need Jesus to save your soul because the law goes beyond just the actual physical act of adultery. It goes into the heart, and God's message, God's spirit reaches into the heart and says, let not your heart lust after a woman. Put down the fires of lust. How? By casting down imaginations. That's how. I abstain from it. I flee from it. I crucify it. I make a covenant with my eyes that I will not look on a maid to lust after her. And I don't I don't think upon those things. I cast them down. Cast down. All sin starts in the heart. The eye is the window of the soul. All sin starts in the heart before it's actively done. Put it down in the thoughts and it will never come to fruition. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We think about the obedience of Christ. We think about how Christ obeyed and we ought to obey. We think how Christ never lusted and we ought not to lust. We think on these things. We change our thinker. We invest in the lives of people and not think carnally. But spiritually, for the for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. I can't war after the flesh. So my answer to to lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not I'm determined never to do that. No, it's oh, God, help me never to do that. Strengthen my heart, and my soul. And then I put into practice the the things that God has commanded me to do. I abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. They war against it. I cast down imaginations. I flee youthful lusts. I crucify the affections and lusts thereof. I count them as crucified. And like... And I do what Joseph did. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord. That's bringing into the thought, every thought. Bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So that thought that wants to roam around and say, hey, that woman is attractive, or hey, that woman, you know, it, you, you stop that, and it brings into captivity. Every thought. And that's truly what would Jesus do. Because after David had sinned, he was never the same again. The chastening of the Lord. The sorrow, the sword would never pass his house. Put sin down in the mind and the heart and it will never get feet to it or hands to it to go about and do evil. Put it down in the heart. Put it down in the mind. Hate it. Hate every false way. Here's another way to deal with it.
Jesus said, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. What was David doing? He was sleeping. When kings go forth to battle, he was sleeping. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Be watchful. Put a guard on your heart. Be watchful. Pray against it. Ask God to strengthen you. By the way, and never be presumptuous to believe that there is no sin that you could not fall for or that there is a sin that you could not fall for. Never believe that. But always watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. To guard yourself against the lust of the eyes. By the way, be careful where you go. Be careful who you hang around. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Don't go to places you know are going to defile you. Don't watch things that you know there's a good chance you're going to be defiled. Flee youthful lusts. Stay away from them. Stay away from them. All right. Well, God bless you, everybody. I'm going to play some songs here. And if you got something you want to say or you want to say hi or anything like that, I'll give you the opportunity. Maybe you want to ask some questions. I'll give you that time. Now everybody's talking about something You can hear as the world passes by Some are talking about their wealth and their mansions Others talk about their trouble and their strife Now I don't know how to talk to a rich man When compared I'm a beggar, no doubt But if you're talking about that old time religion well, I know what you're talking about I like to talk about the time that Jesus saved me When my poor soul was sinking down in sin I like to talk about the times that he helped me Through the sunshine, the storm, and the rain I like to talk about the time of his coming When I see his sweet face there's no doubt Now if you're talking about that old time religion Well I know what you're talking about Now if you're talking about the old time religion Well I can tell you what you're talking about About the kind that would make you love your pastor When old Satan would say Kick him out about the kind that would comfort you in sorrow And would never, never fail to make you shout Now if you're talking about that old time religion Well I know what you're talking about Alright, let's see here Where'd that go? Alright, here we go See if I can find that. And by the way, none of the apostles were out kicking out their gifts, running around holding big beans. <laughs> Yeah, no, break this board. Okay. Ah! You know that? 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 Ah! You
Okay, let's do that one more time because that is just too funny. There's another one on here. Let me see if I can find it. Let's see if I can find one of Carl's favorite ones. Let's see. There it is. And he's telling him about these these encounters with Bigfoot that he's having. The Nephilim, 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 Nephilim. And, and I lifted up my sword. Crazy. And I was like, Ksh, and he was like, Ksh, and I was like, Ksh. I'm getting my shotgun. I'm getting my 45. Dead spiritual warfare. <laughs> Give me my gun. Give me my 50 cal. Give me my, my Uzi, whatever I got. Just give me something. And I'm blowing these things away. The okay. Earth. So you aimed your prayer. What are you like? A prayer? You got a prayer bazooka? You got a prayer <laughs> missile? I aimed in strong spiritual warfare i aimed my prayers at that side boom and i fired this sounds like intense spiritual warfare he did spiritual warfare prayer and 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 strong spiritual warfare i guess whatever that is those are the key words strong spiritual warfare i'm gonna take my guns and i'm gonna get my car and i'm gonna go home I'm going home. I'm not sitting in the woods with a bunch of whatever they are. And we did strong spiritual warfare. Strong spiritual warfare. Yeah, and yeah. I did strong warfare. Because we're in strong spiritual warfare. Go <laughs> home. If there was some Bigfoot crazy psychotic devilish creature out there that was growling and grunting and backmasking Led Zeppelin songs to me all night. I, I'm not going to sleep, bro. No way, I, dude. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm not sleeping with that thing there. We both did intense spiritual warfare. And I saw golden roosters. When Bigfoot didn't touch me and left me alone, I did strong spiritual warfare. Bigfoot ran. If the struggle is real. That's the truth, man. They won't be hairy. They won't stink. Intense spiritual, spiritual warfare. warfare. Glory in the upper bowl, and he shoots the glory at him. Glory in the lower bowl, and he what? Tie you can. <laughs> This Bigfoot was talking to my mind telepathically. Okay, that it was in a biological container. What are hoops? Like, whoop, whoop. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> oh, that's too funny, man. Oh, you got to laugh, man. Those things are funny, man. Oh, let's see. What if I have any other funny ones on there? Let's see. Let's see. What's this? I have no idea what this is. Afternoon. All right, I'm gonna get this out of my way here. If I put, do you think if I put this Baptist history book on top of this this one, there'll be a war down there? Put <laughs> <laughs> them on opposite sides there. Hey. Oh no. Hey. It's the selfie stick. That made you look important. <laughs> For only three seconds. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now, 
Is everybody ready to smile? I have no idea what this is. I don't think that sounds like... <laughs> I didn't even bring it very confident. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear a lot of confidence there. Uh, anyway, well, uh, let's pray. We're going to get into this. I want to turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. All right, let's pray. Father, Lord, I pray you be with us now and help us. Lord, just guide us and direct us, Lord. I, I believe that we have a lot of young couples here, Lord, and we have older. I must have been preaching about something. I don't know what that is. Anyway, I have no idea. There's a lot of stuff. Here's Brandon. All right, everybody. Well, uh, I'll be. Let's make sure we pray for Chain Breaks' dad, uh, who's having some health issues, and um, pray for Teresa as um, her ex-husband passed away. And you know, let's be in prayer for for those things uh, that that people have burdens and their hearts are broken over. Okay. So we'll definitely do that. Um, I'm glad that you all were able to come on here today. And uh, hey, uh, we'll be putting some new sermons on. I, I have some. We just haven't got them ready yet for some reason. I got to figure out what's going on. But uh, we'll, we'll get those straightened out here pretty soon. Uh, we'll have some new sermons uh, if you want to find some sermon audio or YouTube. Also, if you want to support our ministry, you can mail us something. There's our address. Or you can PayPal us at salvationpreacher at gmail.com or pastorcooley at icloud.com. If you'd like to support our ministry uh, that way, you can do that. I also do Apple Pay now, which is pretty cool because I didn't know how to do that, but somebody showed me. So we do that as well. So we will uh, have that available. Uh, will you stream on Sunday? Yes, I'm streaming the sermons only. On Sunday, so in the morning and in the afternoon, uh, the Baptist history will be streamed, Lord willing. So we will be doing that. So you pray uh, about uh, being there if you can. If you don't have a church, uh, you can listen, all right? But we definitely will be doing that. And I'm glad that it was an encouragement to you. Uh, and I hope that you share this with people that need it. All right. Well, God bless you all. Take care and we will see you very